Well, good morning. It's good to see you all here today. It's a beautiful day. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. And uh, let me just say welcome to Berlin Baptist Church and uh, glad that you're here for worship this morning. I want to know, uh, just personally want you to know that uh, here's why I'm kind of excited about today. Uh, sometimes, if you ever notice, if you realize when things, when some things, like small details, tend to just not work out the way you plan, if you, re if you take a moment and realize uh, our enemy is constantly trying to get at us and trying to throw little things in our way to just get us off track or distracted, and I've, I've had two or three of those things happen earlier this morning to me. So I feel like that means uh, good things are going to happen today. So I uh, just want to share that with you, and uh, that's my expectation today. I'm excited about this morning. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you got a bulletin when you came in, uh, all the information you need for today and the days ahead are, are right here. Um, so just know that uh, under our current circumstances, you know, there's not a, a whole lot of announcements as far as events are concerned. But I will mention one thing to you that, that is in the, the works coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the week prior to school beginning, which now school is going to begin, it's, it's slated to begin on the 31st of August. And so that prior week, which is the week of the 23rd of August, we're going to organize at some point that week uh, a prayer walk for our schools to make sure we can go and pray over our teachers and our staff and the, the school uh, facilities themselves, and so more information will come about that when we get a definitive date and time for anyone who would like to be a part of that. But just wanted you to know ahead of time that that's going to be planned and it's going to be happening here in the next couple of weeks. So um, it'll be good to be at least get out and and be uh, doing something outside uh, outside the the four walls here. So uh, that's coming up soon. Everything else I believe you need is is in your bulletin there. And I do want to share some scripture, though, as we get started. And this one in particular is it's very special to me um, because it, it's a prayer. It's, it's a desire, I hope, for all of us. It comes from Psalm 95. And just the first few verses, the, the whole psalm is, is beautiful. But the first few verses of Psalm 95, listen to what the Bible says. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. And let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. That, that uh, beginning, those first three verses, just really puts your heart and mind in the right place. Hopefully gets you focused and, and mindful of how wonderful God is, and how great He is, and how worthy of praise He is. So I hope that's your prayer today uh, as you've come here to worship that, uh, man, we're here to make a big deal about Jesus and sing our praise to Him and give to Him and study His Word, and hopefully all those things will uh, combine and contribute together to help us be better disciples and live lives more suitable to belonging to Christ. So to that end, let me pray for us as we get started today, uh, and then we'll begin our worship time. Father, I thank you so much for this beautiful day and the, the privilege we have uh, of joining together this morning, uh, coming here uh, to worship you and to be in your presence, to fellowship with one another. And so, Father, I pray that you'll be glorified. Uh, that's my prayer above everything else. Whatever work you desire to do in our hearts today, I pray we will be open and receptive to it, that we'll cooperate with your spirit and be uh, open to everything you want to do in our midst today. Help us to uh, take a moment to uh, examine ourselves, that we would see that there's, if there's anything in our hearts or minds or lives that doesn't honor you, that you would bring that to our attention so we can get rid of it and so we can worship you in spirit and in truth, that we can receive your forgiveness and just enjoy your presence. So, Lord, I pray 
uh, in everything we do today, I pray Jesus Christ will be lifted up and honored and that your work will be accomplished in our lives. Help us to be good witnesses to the truth of the gospel as we leave here later today. Uh, help us to uh, exemplify the characteristics of Jesus as we interact with people in our community, in our families, in our workplaces. And, and Lord, we just want to give you all the praise and glory and honor for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is a song that is, um, touches my heart, and I hope it touches your heart as well. If you know the words, sing along with us. It's called Waymaker.
Well, here we are today again in the book of Acts, and today we're going to actually be looking at Acts chapter 9, the first uh, portion of that, maybe the first two-thirds of that chapter. And this is uh, an interesting chapter. This is kind of uh, one of several climactic points in the text of, of this book especially. And I, I titled the message today, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Damascus because of who we're talking about. We got introduced to this young man uh, last week. Uh, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, the very end of the passage, we saw this, this man's name mentioned, Saul. And in the, the drama of the early church, we had not yet been introduced to that young man. And here's what was said about him, just uh, briefly. And this is in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. Saul was present when Stephen was killed. Okay, so you, you go all the way back to chapter 6, and the church was growing by leaps and bounds, and they had some growing pains, had some needs need to be met, so the apostles said, hey, select seven men from among you that can meet this need, and here's the criteria, got to be spiritual men, full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Stephen was the first one named. Then we saw another one of them, Philip, who was a, a great evangelist we saw last week. So Stephen... Uh, basically got in trouble because he was doing the Lord's work, telling the truth, you know, being a good man of God, and he got in trouble and got killed for it. And the Bible tells us in verse 58, chapter 7, that the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then we didn't hear about it again until chapter 8, verse 1, and that was the end of that story two weeks ago, Saul approved of his execution. So we get introduced to this guy just in a couple of short verses. Then we find out who he is. He's a young, uh, a rising star in the Pharisees. He was very well educated, uh, a good-looking guy from what we're told. You know, he had good, you know, good, just a, a stereotypical you know, like a GQ of the day, that type of fella. So he was very smart, and he used that to his advantage, uh, but he was working for the wrong goal, and he didn't know it at the time. So in, in chapter 8, at the beginning, we see Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death, and that day, the Bible told us last week, there arose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And all the disciples were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria except for the apostles. And then it talked about the burial of Stephen. But then look at chapter 8, verse 3. Saul was ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So this is who we're talking about here. He's a bad dude. Okay, If you're, if you're following Jesus... In the early church, in this movement, Saul was a bad dude, okay? And so, it made me think, do we know anybody like that? Do, we, do you know anybody, if you had to uh, just go through the Rolodex of your mind real quick and think, do I know anybody or know of anybody who is really, really smart? but they're using the gifts that God gave them for the wrong thing. Maybe they're not a believer. Maybe they're, they're, they've been given this aptitude to learn. They've got this unbelievable intellect. Maybe they're just super intelligent, and they're really good at whatever chosen field they're in, but they're not using it for the glory of God. They think they're maybe they're doing a good thing. You know anybody like that? Anybody spring to mind? Here's what happens when I think of stuff like that. I think of uh, really smart people just in the culture, in the world, but are not believers. I think of somebody like maybe, I don't know, Bill Gates. You know, uh, more money than Carter's got liver pills. 
And what's he using it for? In his own mind, he might be doing good. He might be giving to different charitable organizations, but is he, is he glorifying God? I don't know. I don't know the man. I'm, it's, it's not my place to judge, so I don't know. But I think about people like that, people who have, uh, by the world's standards, have excelled, and they are uh, maybe in the world's eyes, they're on a pedestal. Maybe they have succeeded uh, to the utmost in whatever field they've pursued. And if you ask the, the average person on the street they, about whoever, about that person, they would think probably, oh man, they're sitting on top of the world. They got everything they could ever want. They're super successful. But the question to ask behind all that is this. Where do they stand before Jesus? Because you can have everything the world has to offer and you can be spiritually bankrupt. Did you know there's a little equation that, that helps us understand that Jesus plus nothing equals everything? That's probably a good thing to remember. Jesus plus nothing equals everything and what what that means spiritually speaking is you can have everything the world has to offer and not have Jesus and guess where you're going when you die you're going straight to hell you could have Jesus and very little or nothing that the world has to offer and guess what happens when you die the glory of God an inheritance sealed by the Holy Spirit paid for with the blood of Jesus and, and that's a priceless gift. So here's this fellow Saul. And we're going to read about him. I, I, and here's the plan just going forward. I, uh, just as I've introduced the, what we're looking at today, I'm going to read the text, uh, Acts 9, verses 1 through 31. Then just going to explain a little bit about it and then give us some personal application about what we can draw from this story that's important for us to live. How can we answer those important questions? Remember, we want to ask of the Scriptures every time we read. What does God want me to know? What does God want me to do? What does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about myself? Those are the questions we're looking at when we read this text. So keep those in mind. We'll start reading at uh, chapter 9, verse 1, the book of Acts. Here's what Luke wrote for us as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. 
So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days... He was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He's the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him. And how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that this word would be planted in our hearts. Lord, give us understanding of your truth. Give us strength to obey. Uh, give us insight on how to apply this truth to our lives. And in all things, Lord, I pray you will be glorified in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want you to know, if you hadn't read this recently, or maybe ever, this is a really compelling story right here. Because you cannot paint a picture, I don't think, of a more dramatic turnaround, a bigger contrast between a before and an after of a person's life. And, and let me just tell you, I hope you picked it up as we read through the text. This transition happened quickly. Now, uh, oftentimes, I'll just say at the, at the outset here, one mistake we could make, potentially, is to read a story like this, and then what's the first thing you want to do? You want to compare that with your own personal experience. And then here is the danger in that. Comparison is the thief of joy in many, in many uh, instances. So you read this story and you see what Jesus did in the life of Saul and you understand the, the almost uh, lightning bolt experience that he experienced and, and the way he transitioned from what he was on his way to do and what he ended up doing and you think to yourself... Nothing like that ever happened to me. And, and so immediately, what, what could you start? You could start doubting yourself. You could start feeling uh, badly about your own experience. And, here, and I hate to use this person as an example, but my wife, for years, not so much anymore, but early on uh, in our marriage, uh, felt... Uh, like her testimony was maybe not as dynamic as some others that she had heard or that we had heard together or if we've been different places and hear someone speaking and, and telling their story of how maybe uh, they've... And, and typically it would go something like this. Well, I was going down this path and I was involved in all these 
evil things, you know, maybe, maybe it was drugs, maybe it was alcohol, maybe it was uh, all these different behaviors, and the Lord Jesus stepped in and saved me, and now my life is turned around, and all those things are gone out of my life, I'm living for the glory of God, and that sounds so sensational. But let me just, and, and we've talked about this over the years, let me just remind you of one simple truth. You ready? Everybody needs to hear this. If you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation and forgiveness and eternal life, guess what? That is a miracle of God. You have been taken from certain death to eternal life. That's, that's amazing. And, and it, that doesn't happen without Christ. That is a dynamic testimony. Anytime God saves somebody, it's a miracle. So please, whatever you do as you sit here this morning, don't ever demean or downplay your own personal salvation experience, even if it doesn't compare to maybe what you've heard or read or seen uh, from someone else. Jesus saved you, snatched you out of the fires of hell. That's a miracle. It's a miracle every time it happens. So just because we can't compare our experience to something like Saul, please understand, if you belong to Jesus, a miracle has happened in your life. And God did it. So let's, let's just kind of rehearse this story and, and pick up some things here we need to know. So how does it begin? If you remember from the, the text that I uh, shared before, Stephen was being killed, Saul was there giving approval, watching the coats of the people who, who participated. Then it says that when the persecution that day broke out against the church in Jerusalem, Saul was, the Bible says it was ravaging the church. Okay, so he was one of the main players in that persecution that caused the scattering of the disciples. Now then, it goes to Philip and his evangelistic efforts and all that he did with, uh, in Samaria and then with the Ethiopian. And then you get back to chapter 9 and you see the very first thing, Saul. So, so understand, the bulk of chapter 8 with the scattering of the disciples and the evangelism that takes place in Samaria and Judea, Saul's kind of like, all that time... He's in Jerusalem wreaking havoc, okay? So all that good stuff that we talked about last week with that Philip was doing, uh, all that time while that was going on, Saul was still wreaking havoc in Jerusalem. So you look at chapter 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples. So he was, he was doing all kind of bad stuff in Jerusalem. Then he's decided, hey, um, I want to go up north. I want to go to some other places and get some more Christians and bring them back here to Jerusalem and throw them in jail. So, here's one thing we need to know. And we talked about this, Darlene and I did, um, yesterday. These folks must have been in some kind of good shape. I mean, just, just saying. They didn't have cars. If they traveled, it was often by foot. Or maybe on an animal, but, but it was slow, okay? So let me just paint this picture for you geographically. All right, so Jerusalem is down south in Judea, okay? And then you got the Dead Sea, you got the Jordan River, then up here you got the Sea of Galilee. Remember last week we looked at a little map about where uh, all where Philip was sent and how all those mileages that he had to walk all this way. All right, so... Saul wants to go, he's in Jerusalem, which is down here, he wants to go to Damascus. Well, if you look at a map, Damascus, you got to go all the way up above the Sea of Galilee through Capernaum, and then over, up like uh, Mount Hermon is another landmark, and you go over to Damascus, which is in modern day Syria. Well, guess what? A straight line distance, and you can't go a straight line, is 136 miles this path from Jerusalem to Damascus is a, a, around 150 miles. If you walk in 150 miles, it's going to take you near about two weeks. So uh, try to get a timeline in your mind of what's happening here. Saul wants to go a long way. 
just to root out the Christians. So he is, he's, he's zealous, okay? He's fired up. He wants to get rid of the Christians. He's going to go all the way. I mean, that's a long, long trip just to try to stamp out Christianity. But that's where he's going. And the Bible says that as he's traveling, uh, verse 3 says he was approaching Damascus. So it had been almost two weeks, near about two weeks, that he had traveled to get to his destination. And that's where, most likely, uh, if you look on the map, like the Capernaum is at the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, and then Damascus is on over. So somewhere between there, says because he was approaching Damascus, the light flashed around him, the light from heaven. And you know the story, we just read it. A voice talks to him and says, Why are you persecuting me? And Saul answers. <laughs> see, he, he, he already knows. Do you see what he says? Look, look what the text says. Verse uh, 5. Who are you, Lord? He, he knew he was in trouble. He knew, he knew what was going on. He was on his way to root out folks who believed in this same Lord, this same Jesus, because the voice said, I am Jesus. And by the way, that right there is the um, characteristic of Saul that qualified him later to be an apostle because he had a meeting with the resurrected Jesus. That right there. That encounter uh, was part of his qualification to be an apostle. So Jesus tells him to get up and go into the city, and you'll, you'll be told what you are to do. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes, just a little bit of application along the way here, sometimes I wish that God's will would be given to me like that. And a voice saying, hey, go over here, and I'm going to tell you exactly what to do. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, gosh. Uh, it's like a, a, a writing in the sky, or, you know, then there's no doubt you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. But it, it doesn't always, well, I was going to say it doesn't always. It, it rarely works that way, right? And here's a statement from Chuck Swindoll that I will share with you that I think is very helpful. Ready? Those who are most unsure about God's will are usually those who are least acquainted with His Word. I've, I, I still struggle with this. I've struggled with it all my life, all my Christian life. Here's the question we ask. I wish God would just speak to me. I wish God would just tell me something. Guess what? He did. He did. We got 66 books guaranteed Word of God right here. So if we want God to speak to us, we have to be in His Word. It kind of makes sense, right? Those who are usually most unsure about God's will, are those who are least acquainted with his word. So Saul gets some marching orders. Go into the city. You'll be told what you must do. He got up. He was blind. He was led by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind, had nothing to eat or drink. Now, when we get to verse 10, Ananias comes on the scene, and God uses him to help further uh, solidify the will that uh, God has given to Saul. And he says, uh, you're going to go see Saul. And Ananias is like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I've heard about this guy. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be absent from visitation on this night, right? I'm not going visiting today. But God says, it's okay. You see that in verse 13? I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's got authority here from the chief priest. But look at verse 15, what the Lord says. L look what he says about Saul. He is a chosen instrument of mine. Folks, at some point usually a lot we have to wrestle we got to wrestle with this with this friction between um, man's responsibility and God's sovereignty and if you're going to ask me well what do you think about I don't know 
Okay? So don't, I mean, I, I can't explain it. I just, I just believe what the Bible says, and whatever the Bible says is what I preach, because I can't make sense of that. I can't make sense of God orchestrating so many things in particular ways, and yet we're still responsible and accountable for everything we do. And so that's, I just know God designed it so it must work. Okay, that, that's what I know. It, it's God, that's God's plan. Okay, he's a chosen instrument of mine. And Saul, and look, look what he says though. He's going to take my word, my name, before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. And then look at verse 16. I'm going to show him how much he's going to have to suffer. Suffering is a part of serving Jesus. And that is not a popular headline. But it's the truth. The more we try, the more we set our hearts and minds, I am going to follow Jesus, that enlarges the bullseye on our back that the enemy's aiming at. Okay? Just remember that. Suffering is a part of service. So I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias goes, and he does his job. He visits Saul, and he uh, delivers the message. He heals the blindness by the power of God, and Saul regains his sight. He gets up. What's the first thing? Look at that. Oh, that's so good. What's the first thing that happens when Saul... Uh, is visited by Ananias, and the message is delivered. Look at verse 18. Something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. He rose. He didn't eat yet. He, was, he, he hadn't eaten in three days and three nights. But he didn't eat. First thing, what did he do? He got baptized. He got baptized. See, spiritual things precede physical things. Spiritual priorities come before physical priorities. And that's, that doesn't make sense in, in, I, in, my, in my mind, right? Because, I, you know, think about it. He got baptized before he had a meal. But he, was, he took food and was strengthened there in verse 19. So the main thing of application here that we find in the middle of this story Almost, almost at the end, at the climax of, of Saul's salvation experience, the thing that we got to see very clearly that we can apply to our lives when it comes to um, ministry, evangelism especially, okay? Evangelism. Now I want you to take note. It took Saul about two weeks to travel from Jerusalem to Damascus, right? And as he approached the city... The light shone on him. Jesus spoke to him. He was blinded. He went into the city. Three days and three nights passed, right? So we can get in a timeline. Ananias shows up at God's uh, leading. He delivers the message. Uh, he prays, lays his hand on, prays for Saul. The scales fall from his eyes. He's healed. He gets baptized. So now we're about two and a half weeks in. He gets baptized. He get, takes a meal. He gets some strength. Now... What is the very first... He's not... Listen, he's not been to Sunday school. He's not, been, he's not been to the first worship gathering of the Christian church. Hadn't even found a church. He was trying to destroy a church. He hadn't, even, hadn't joined a church yet. Hadn't been to Sunday school. Hadn't been to Bible study. Hadn't been to a small group. Hadn't been to anything. He just got saved. He just got baptized. What is the very first thing he does? Look at verse 19 leading into verse 20. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately, love that word, immediately he proclaimed Jesus. Where? In the synagogue. All right, so here's Mr. Pharisee, valedictorian of the Pharisee class. Smartest guy in the room, most likely, from all accounts. And, and he goes into the synagogue, which is where he would have been uh, leading, had he been back in his home area. 
and, and he doesn't teach Judaism. He proclaims Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in the middle of enemy territory. He goes in the city where he was supposed to be rooting out Christians. He goes to the synagogue. And he tells everybody in there, oh, by the way, everything y'all believe is wrong. Jesus is the Messiah. That's not a way to win friends and influence people by the world standard, okay? So that's, that's what he's done. Immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. And then what was the reaction? Verse 21. What? What did you say? Everybody was amazed, it says in verse 21. All who heard him were amazed and said, Isn't this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And hasn't he come here for the same purpose? To bring bound before the chief priests those who call on Jesus? But then look at verse 22. Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus. Now I want you to see this, next, this last little part of the sentence because this is... This is nothing to, to scoff at here. You see the end of verse 22? You see the word used right there? He didn't suggest. He didn't give his side or his opinion. The Bible says he proved that Jesus was the Christ. You see that? He confounded the Jews in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. And, and here's another little minor detail. It's not minor. It's a detail, though. You know what he used to do that? He used the Old Testament. New Testament wasn't in fully written form yet. Because this, this stuff was happening. Okay? So they hadn't written it down yet. It, those events you see in the Gospels. But the church had just begun. He, he was a scholar in the Old Testament Scriptures. And guess what just happened when Jesus met him on the road? His understanding of the Old Testament completely changed. Everything he was taught about the Old Testament Scriptures, the interpretation of the Scriptures, completely changed. He knew the Scriptures he did not understand the scriptures in light of Jesus, and now he did. And he used those same Old Testament scriptures, all the prophets, um, the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he used all that to prove Jesus was the Christ. It kind of sounds like what Jesus did in Luke 24 when he told the disciples from Moses and the, the prophets and the Psalms everything about himself. Kind of sounds pretty similar, doesn't it? See, if you, if you want to think that the Old Testament is not necessary, or it's not, maybe it's harder to read, and yeah, it is harder to read sometimes, get that. We can't understand the New Testament correctly or fully until we understand the Old Testament. Because Saul used the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus was the Christ. Try to wrap your head around that, because it takes a little while. He used the Old Testament Scriptures. So he's preaching powerfully. He's proving that Jesus is the Christ. He kept getting stronger. And what happens whenever you preach Jesus and you uh, are in public, usually a synagogue, what happens? Opposition, right? Now, everybody that was on Saul's side is not on his side anymore. Because look at verse... 25. You see what happened? As he gets stronger, he's proven that Jesus is the Christ. Now, now what happens? Oh, the Jews want to kill him now. <laughs> so, see, they were on his side. He was on their side, and now he switched teams. It's almost like if, you know, if... Uh, I better not say that. Somebody's going to get offended. Well, no, I'll say it anyway. It's almost like if somebody is playing for the Gamecocks and you know, they're on the losing team and then they decide they're going to switch and they're going to transfer to Clemson and then all of a sudden they're on the winning team but now everybody on the losing team wants to kill them. It's kind of like that. Some of you are smiling and laughing. Some of you look like you're out there ready to come out your pew. 
Well, I'm sorry. That was just that was just off the top of my head. That was the best illustration I'd come up with. So they wanted to kill him. They plotted to kill Saul. His disciples let him loose. Now, did you note that little word there? Saul's got disciples now all of a sudden. He's, he is preaching and teaching so powerfully, he hadn't been saved a few days. And he's already made a name of someone who is an advocate for the gospel. He is a known in Damascus. He is known to teach and preach the gospel, the truth of Christ. After a few days, you see where we're going with this? Personal application, you see where it's going? Anybody, anybody, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. Anybody just get saved like two days ago? This is your first time ever in a gathered meeting of the church. Saul immediately proclaimed Jesus. He's the Son of God. He confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus, proving Jesus was the Christ. And so then he, the Jews wanted to kill him. So his disciples helped him escape. Now, it says here in verse 26, when he had come to Jerusalem. You know what that means? 150 miles. Two more weeks of walking. See, these guys... I mean, they, their cardio was on point. They, they were good. They just walked 150 miles back to Jerusalem. So the Bible says when he came come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid because they didn't think he was real. <laughs> it's like, no, he, he, this is just another ploy. He, he didn't really get saved. No, he's, he's just acting like that so he can come in here and kill us all. That's, that's what he's doing. So they didn't, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe in his conversion. But, but look what happened. You remember who Barnabas is? You remember? You remember back in Acts chapter 5? Somebody sold a piece of land and brought all the money to the church. Remember that? Right before the other Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira, right before they lied and tried to hold back some money but said it was everything. And then, You remember that story? Well, everybody needs somebody to vouch for them sometimes. It, you need... You need a, a witness to your faith. Someone who no, 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 he's, he's legit. He, he's not acting. He's not lying. I've seen him. I've heard him. And he's preaching the gospel. Somebody needs to corroborate your witness. You need to have a credible, believable, discernible witness. That, that, that's what we need as believers. When, if, when we go to talk about Jesus... It's a shame. It's a shame when you you open your mouth to witness for Christ, and someone standing around is able to say, "Nah, I, I don't think so." I I mean, I just talked to him last week, and he didn't sound anything like a Christian. No, I just, I just watched him out in, in town the other day, and no, I don't know who you're talking about, but that guy didn't look like any Christian I've ever heard of. A credible witness. A, cre a credible witness is one that when you open your mouth for Jesus, nobody is going to speak up and say, oh, I don't know. Everybody's going to say, well, yeah, I totally believe that. Because that's, that's who that person is. That's how they live. That's how they talk. That's what they believe. That makes perfect sense. You see, you see what I'm saying? I've, I've had that. I mean, I've had it. I'm, I'm just being honest, personal example. When I was, when I was 20 years old, Maybe not. Oh, you're going to church? <laughs> Never would have guessed that. 
you're a Christian? Really? Hmm, interesting. I might have to change my, my definition of what a Christian is. See, that, you know what that does? That can completely destroy a witness for Christ, a witness of a church, a witness of, in, in, a, com, in a community, a credible witness. Saul was building his credibility, but it helped because someone else came alongside and said, no, no, I saw it myself. Barnabas said he, he took him and brought him. Verse 26 said they didn't believe he was a disciple, but Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how, look at verse, in, uh, end of verse 27, at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. See, there were witnesses of the change. Oh, this is good. People saw the change in his life. It was visible. It was not just him walking up and saying, Oh, by the way, um, I've changed everything I believe now. I believe in Jesus. And everybody's going to be like, Yeah, okay, sure. No, no. People saw it. People heard him. He preached boldly in the name of Jesus in the middle of a synagogue in Damascus in enemy territory. So Barnabas vouched for him and told them, no, he, he was preaching for the name of Jesus. So then verse 28 says, he went in and out among the, uh, among the disciples, among the apostles in Jerusalem, preaching boldly again in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews, and guess what they wanted to do? Verse 29. They were also trying to kill him. You see, you see what happens? I, I said this at the beginning. I'll say it again. The more we determine in our hearts and minds we are following Jesus, the more opposition is going to rise. It, it, it's going to happen. If, if you are making, your, making it known that you are following Jesus standing up for Jesus, there will be opposition. If you're not experiencing any opposition, then, I said before, I'll say again, if you're not experiencing opposition, one of two things is true. You're not preaching Jesus, or, or nobody can tell that you're a Christian. And, and I've, Hey, I'm not preaching at you. I've experienced both of those. Okay? You want to you wanna not have opposition from the world? Just, just don't tell anybody you're a Christian and don't tell anybody about Jesus. And, and you'll be fine. You, you won't be obedient to God, but you'll be fine. Ask me how I know. I've done it. I've done it. It's a terrible place to be. It's easy to defend your faith when nobody knows you have it. So the Jews are plotting to kill him. The Hellenistic Jews are trying to kill him. Saul was testifying boldly. How does the story end? Saul is taken to Caesarea and sent north to Tarsus, back to his home, back to his hometown. Caesarea, remember, uh, last week when Philip was uh, at Gaza, then he found himself at, at uh, Azotus, and then he walked all the way up the coast of the Mediterranean, all the way up to Caesarea. That's where they took Saul and sent him off to Tarsus, back to his home. And then, so what is the, what is the result? How does the gospel uh, go forth based on what God did in Saul's life? Look at verse 31. The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, so all the way, the, all that whole region had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. See, these were all consequences for the church. The peace, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the multiplication of the gospel, the church multiplied, consequences that were brought about by God's work in a brand new believer. Please don't miss that. When Saul was in Damascus, 
he had been saved a day, three, three days. He, he, he was three days and three nights without sight. Then Ananias came. He, he was baptized, and he started preaching immediately. For a few, it says many days there, so who, however many days is. And then he went two weeks back to Jerusalem and did the same thing. Encountered death threats in both places. But the result for the gospel was the church multiplied. They had peace. They had the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And the church multiplied. All because somebody got saved. And, and listen to this. And he did what saved people do. He told everybody about Jesus. Y'all see that? That's what saved people do. Is they tell people about Jesus. Saul was brand new Christian. Brand new. And he immediately redirected every gift he had. He already had the knowledge of a Pharisee scholar of the Old Testament and he immediately flipped the goal of that and used it to prove that Jesus was the Christ God has given us all gifts the question is are we using those gifts that knowledge whatever it may be leveraging it for the glory of God that's what Saul did Saul is an example of what God can do through every believer, if we are obedient to his call. What do Christians do? What is the model of discipleship, the journey of faith, the influence of a changed life? It's the church is multiplying. The gospel is being preached. Jesus is being proclaimed as the Messiah, the Son of God. And the church is at peace comforted by the Holy Spirit, and multiplying. I'm, I'm just going to say it the only way I know to say it. it. It doesn't ultimately matter what is going on in the culture, in the world, with... I, I got a, a thing on my phone that lists for the last 20 years there's been some major something every year. Well, this is going to kill us. Oh, next year, this is going to kill us. And then in oh, 2009, it was the swine flu. This is going to kill us. And every year, it's something. This year, it's the COVID-19. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, ultim ultimately, I'm saying, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. It matters. But ultimately, spiritually, it's not bigger than Christ and the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we have a, an account of the, uh, the experience that Saul had. We can learn from it. We can see your work in his life and the, the mighty works you did through him, the way he preached the gospel so boldly in the face of opposition, in the face of death threats. So God, help us to learn from this story. Help us to apply these truths to our lives. Help us to be bold with the truth of the gospel. And help us to, to be open to sharing with, with everyone we can, as you've called us to do, and, and see the effects of just trusting you and uh, relying on the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to glorify you. We need your spirit. We need your strength in order to do your will. So just uh, help us with that, Lord. Help us to read your word, pray, tell people about Jesus, be on mission, fulfill uh, the vision you've given us as a church, Lord, that you would be glorified in all things. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I thank you for being here today. And uh, don't forget this evening... Have the, the youth will meet this evening at 5 o'clock. They meet 5 to 7. And then uh, adult Bible study will be right here in the sanctuary tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll be continuing on in Revelation. We'll be in chapter 7 tonight. 
It's kind of an interlude in the action in Revelation. It's going to be interesting. So I uh, encourage you to be here for that. And uh, listen, uh, just let me, let me just make sure you all know this. Uh, I'm praying for you. I, I love you all. I love this church. I, I love being here. I love just the, the privilege we have to serve together and be together. And, and just know I'm praying for you. And uh, I hope that you'll remember, just pray for each other. Pray for the church. Pray. There's a lot of, lot of uh, things going on. And uh, we, can't, we don't ever waste time when we're praying. That, that's never wasted time. So I just encourage you to do that. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all back here tonight. Brother John, would you pray for us, please, sir?